Stan? Yeah. Ready to roll? Okay, ASP viewers, we're going to give you a presentation here on Polish pistols, basically the Viz 35, the Radom. And we're going to start over here with this chart. When Poland was created after the end of World War I, this is the pistols they acquired for their army. You can see it's 11 different pistols using 10 different non-interchangeable cartridges. So this was not something they really wanted to do. Now, if you're a gun person, you read all this stuff and you go, okay, I'm good. But since some people aren't, we've made a display here of some of the guns that they inherited. The 30 Mauser and the designation they gave it. All right. The pocket pistol, which an officer could buy, the 1914 model. The French gave them revolvers and automatic pistols, also known as the rubies. Some Americans showed up, Polish Americans, and they brought with them their 45 automatics. All right. They also inherited some Russian guns and the Gantt revolver, which got to be the revolver for the cavalry and the police force. And then over here we have the Steyr and his little war story that's gonna go with it, the Steyr nine millimeter, all right? Now, as they created the, um, the Polish government was looking at the standardizing on, on, on a pistol. And they were in negotiations with Czechoslovakia and two Polish engineers, and here's their names, because I don't wanna mess them up. Two Polish engineers, looked at it and said, that's an awful lot of money to pay the Czechoslovakians for a pistol. I'm sure we can design one. That's just as good. And they started to work on a pistol. And they created the pistol that I have here. They originally were going to call it the WIS, Wies after them, the two guys' names. And somebody on the Polish general staff, being Roman Catholic and familiar with the Latin language, decided, no, we're going to call it the V's, V-I-S, which is Latin for power. And that is the birth of the M1935 V's pistol. Now, over here, if you're a collector, this is the ultimate book right now on the V's, okay? If you're going to be a collector, this is the one. For many years, the only books that were available were these two. The Radom pistol, this, and this one here by Lappin. And there were articles, for example, this is an article from Gun Collecting Magazine, all right? And it talks about the different types of Radom pistols and its history, all right? And over here is another article from a magazine called Surplus, and it had information also on it. It's a nice collector item. It is a strong, well-built, pistol, all right? What I want you to understand is if you have one of them, you got a good pistol. And if you don't trust a 75-year-old Springs, I recommend you just go to the Wolf Company and they will sell you a rebuild kit with Springs. What's the, uh, this one? Okay, this one here is, um, this is the NRA publication, gun, it used to be called Arms in the Man, now it's called Gun Collector. And this is December of 2013? Yep. yep. Okay. All right, so, they developed the pistol, and we're going to go through the history of how it developed. Okay, the first pistols, they're called three levers. There's a little lever here, which people think is a safety. It's not. It's for disassembly. This drops the hammer. This releases the slide. And these are, if you're a Polish collector, these are the ones you want. You want the early, what are referred to as the Polish Eagle. And they were made in 1936, 37, 38, 39. All right? That's the one you want to get. Now, it's cut in the back for a shoulder stock, which was never really produced, and that's another story, all right? Now, this holster here is a reproduction, but it's a quality reproduction, and they go anywhere for $35 to $45. It holds the pistol, two magazines, and a cleaning rod. All right, now, the Radom factory was taken over by the Germans by about the second week of the war. And when they took over the factories, the people working there started to sabotage a lot of the machinery. So the factory was not originally operational. The Germans liked the pistol and decided they would continue production. 
And we're gonna see, let me show you a chart I have over here. All right, this chart, Polish pistol inventory, October 1st, 1936, they had a, most of the army was equipped with 32 caliber pistols and a few Steyr eight millimeters, and they had 40 of the experimental VIS, okay? By January 7th, 1938, you can see they were down two of the pistols in the 30 caliber. They had some eight millimeter and they had some nine millimeter Steyrs, okay? But now the VIS, 29,000, okay? Now, what's gonna happen is when the war starts, again, this is the standard Polish pistol. Now, my uncle, who was in the Polish army, who was only a private and was equipped with a Mauser, was assigned to clean officer pistols. And the pistol he had to clean was right here, this style, the Steyr. So I know they had them. And he told, you know, I remember 25 years after the war, he was sitting there and he would draw and explain to me how to take the gun apart and everything else. Now, when the army was collapsing, they were told to either get to Romania or head back to your village and do not fight the Russians. Well, he went back to his village, which is right here. I'm pointing it out. Put Haitia. And now it's called this name. It's Ukrainian, okay? It's now part of Ukraine. Him and his friend each kept a Steyr pistol, and they buried him out in the woods, covered him up in case they could retrieve him later. They never got a chance because they were then taken to Russia. So if you live in Podhaitche, and you know where the woods are, and you want to spend a lot of time with a metal detector, you might find two Steyr pistols. If you can find where the Zahovich farm was and where the barn was, you will find where my grandfather buried a whole bunch of Mauser rifles. All right. Now, the first production here, okay, we're going to call it Nazi Type 1. It was a, basically an exact good copy except for the markings. All right. It had the three levers. It had the cut for the shoulder stock. Nice finish. Now, the Polish underground was, of course, working there, and the Nazis were afraid that they would make guns for the, pol for the underground. So what they did is they would not make barrels in Radom. They would make everything but the barrel. They would then ship it to Austria, and in Austria they would add the barrel. So what did the underground do? They created a illegal barrel factory in Warsaw. And what they would do is smuggle out the parts, put the barrel in, and they had a gun. They also found a trick they were starting to use, which is duplicate serial numbers. They would make two guns with the same serial number, smuggle one out to the underground. The underground would then grind off the number and use it. Well, unfortunately, somebody didn't get the word and he left the number on the gun. The Gestapo captured it. They see the gun with the serial number. They try to trace the gun. They find out that the gun has been sent to a police department in Germany. They go there and there's the gun. So now they realize what was happening and approximately 50 workers at the factory were executed for their trick of duplicate serial numbers, all right? Now, why would the police department have the Radom? The German army number one pistol was the P-38. Number two was the Luger, which was made as late as 1943. If you were in the SS, the Air Force, or the Navy, you were expected to get your pistols somewhere other than from the main factories because the Wehrmacht was supposed to have a monopoly first dibs on the good guns. So if you were in the SS, the uh, paratroopers, which were part of the Air Force or the Navy, you had to find guns for yourself from some of the captured countries. So a lot of these are gonna end up in the hands of the SS, the Falsenjäger, which is the paratroopers, uh, the police, or the Navy. So this is referred to as the Type 1 guns. They are almost exact copies. They have the shoulder stock slot. Nice finish. They then went to what we call Grade 2. All right? They eliminated the shoulder stock, which was meaningless anyway. All right? And the finish on the guns wasn't as nice. Uh, the bluing wasn't as good. And they started to make what we call shortcuts, okay? And one of the shortcuts, over here you will see it's got a cutout for the finger. A little later, they eliminated that, okay? And these are referred to as the Type 2 guns, uh, either with or without the finger cutout. But they were, they were starting to uh, make the guns a little cheaper. 
All right, then the last group, number three, grade, group, grade three, they eliminated the takedown lever. They did is they redesigned the hammer so you could cock the gun, drop the, uh, the hammer release, and it would lock back and you could, you could take it apart. You will also notice the grips here are wood. Sometimes you'll find them with brown plastic, not the black plastic that was on the original guns. And the finish is a lot rougher. Uh, they're making shortcuts. They're trying to increase production. Now, the last gun here, late 1944, the Russian army was going through Poland and the Germans evacuated their factory and they produced what we called grade four guns. And these were guns that were made totally in Austria. Uh, how do you spot them? Gray parkerized finish, phosphate. You can see the unfinished wood. Some of these guns don't even have the markings. They're just blank, or they have B and Z, or they don't have even the gripping surface. This was late, late production. Uh, by April of 1945, the Austria had fallen to the, um, to the Allies. Now, this gun was a GI Bringback. It's in the K series, which is the last production guns. And they tend to be in real good condition. I don't think they even got issued. They were captured. Now, it came in this holster, which is kind of beat up. You can hardly make it out, but there's a B and Z marking on the holster. And the magazines, it came with an extra magazine. The magazines were also simplified. All the early magazines have a milled follower. This has a stamped one, similar to that found on a P-38. Again, late war production. They're trying to simplify the guns as much as possible. Now, you saw the Polish holster. These are the German holsters. Very simple. All right, here's one BNZ 1944 for the P-35P. Now, that's to distinguish it from the P-35B, which is the Belgian Browning High Power. All right, so we have brown or black holsters. Sometimes the markings have faded. I'm going to pull the magazine out on this one to show you the milled follower as compared to the stamp follower of the Z series, the last production guns, all right? Now, another black holster, black or brown. This guy's a guy even got, I don't know whether it's a company name or the, or the factory, but this is uh, the German holsters. Very simple flap design with a space for a magazine. No cleaning rod, just a magazine. All right, now over here, the chart, one of the things you're going to run into with the Nazi guns is duplicate serial numbers. Why? Because they started out with A, B, C, D. They skipped some that could be confusing, like an I or an O. And then when they finished, they simplified the guns, grade three, and they started alphabetizing them again. So in theory, you could have two Polish radiums with the same serial number, but one will be a three lever and one will be a two lever. Also, a very common mistake that was made. When you were going to bring your gun back as a souvenir, you had to get, you know, the clerk had to type up the paperwork. And I'm going to show you here a very common mistake that was made. It's got a patent number. And sometimes the clerk would put the patent number down as the serial number for the gun. So when the guys got back to the States and they had to register their gun, they just registered what was on the paperwork rather than looking at what's on the gun. So there's a good number of radiums with serial number that just happens to coincide with the patent number. And this one's the same as these two? This one here, the trigger guard, they didn't have the relief. See here, it's relieved. Yeah, these are both the type two, but they were already simplifying it. You can see here, they, they eliminated the finger relief, which is not found on the later guns at all. Also, the later guns didn't use pins. They used some, a kind of a rivet. They're much harder to take apart. They're not designed to be taken apart. But at the end of the war, I guess they weren't worried about that. So you have here a collection of Radom pistols. And um, again, if you're a collector, I recommend the book. This is the book for a collector. If you just want some information, magazine articles, or these other books are pretty good at giving you just the basic information that you might need for dealing with the Polish Radom pistol. After the war, they were no longer made because they were now under the Soviet bloc and uh, they started making Takarev pistols and other pistols. But the Radom, a good overbuilt gun. It can take a heavy abuse. It can take strong loads. It's, it's a good gun. A single stack nine. 
If you have any comments, please make sure you put them in and share them with other collectors, particularly if you have some of these guns. And remember that there's prefixes on some of the serial numbers and that there's duplicates because of the three lever, two lever designation. The most desirable ones from a collector point of view are the ones with the Polish Eagle and the, the last ones made, the uh, K-Series double lever. And there's one in between that some of the Polish guns were then stamped with Nazi markings as sort of a transition, so they're good. Now, one of these guns, this one here, has a blued barrel. Let me pull it back. Blue barrel was usually for the Navy for some reason, but can you prove it? This is a Navy gun? No, and I would not pay a premium, but if you run into one of these with a blue barrel, particularly the early ones, a type one, there will sometimes be markings right in here, like an O or an N for the North Fleet or whatever it is, and you might get a Kriegsmarine radium. But the blue barrel and occasional markings, again, if you're a collector, you want you know another variation. Uh, the BNZ, I've run into one, a member of the club had one, he didn't want to sell it, and I ran into another collector who had one. They are very rare. They just All they have is a B, N, and a Z on the slide, and we figured that was the early production when they got to uh, Austria and started building the guns there. So good collecting out there, people. Thanks, Dan. All right. Woo!